Doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We're one people, we're one family, we all live in the same house, American house. Members of the faculty, members of the staff, parents, friends, visitors, and you, the members of the student body of this unbelievable Westfield High School. Just walking through the hall, I see some of you have been doing unbelievable, great, and good work, and reading the graphic novel. March. Okay. I, 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 must, I must tell you that I didn't attend a large high school like this school. It's a beautiful place. I attended uh, an overcrowded, poorly staffed school in rural Alabama. Very few students in my class in the 10th, 11th, 12th grade. But I must tell you, I'm delighted and very pleased to be here. I didn't grow up in a big city like Richmond or Washington, D.C., or Chicago, or Atlanta, or New York City. I grew up in rural Alabama, as you know from reading March. My father had been a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four. How many of you remember when you were four? That's pretty good, but what happened to the rest of us? In 1944, when I was four years old, my father had saved $300. And a man sold him 110 acres of land. My family still own this land today. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I know those of you who have been reading March know that as a little boy growing up on this farm, it was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens. Did any of you know anything about raising chickens? No, don't fool me. I know some of you like to eat chicken, right? But you don't know anything about raising chickens. But let me tell you what I had to do as a little boy growing up in rural Alabama. When the setting hen was set, I had to take the fresh eggs and mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you smart, gifted students are now saying, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen will get on that same nest, and there will be some more fresh eggs. And you have to be able to tear the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? You don't follow me. It's OK. <laughs> so when the little chicks were hatched, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen, uh, put them in a box with a lantern, and raise them on their own. I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher from the Cicero Buck store. Now, students and probably your teachers and your principal are too young to know anything about the Cicero Buck catalog, but it's a very large book, it's thick, heavy. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. So I just kept on wishing. But as a little boy, about eight or nine years old, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So with the help of my brothers and sisters and my first cousins, 
We would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard, like to gather here in this magnificent gym. And um, we were here at church. I would start speaking or preaching, and some of these chickens would bow their heads, some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I am convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive, at least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that story. Growing up there, when we visit that little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, I would see those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. To go downtown on a Saturday afternoon to see a movie at the theater, all of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony, and all of the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents why. They were, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But in 1955, I heard of Rosa Parks. 1955, I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble. On the farm, I'd be out there working in the field, picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling corn, and I would fall behind. And my mother would say, boy, you need to catch up. You're falling behind. And I would say, this was hard work. And she would say, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. But Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to speak up, to speak out, to find a way to get in the way. So in 1956, 16 years old, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the public library in the little town of True, Alabama, trying to get library card, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to the public library in the little town of Troy, Alabama, until July 5th, 1998, for a book signing of my first book, Walking with the Wind. And hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up. We had a wonderful program, wonderful book signing, something to eat, something to drink. The end of the program, they gave me a library card. It says something about the distance we've come and the progress we've made. I know some of you are saying, now John Lewis, how did you get involved in the Civil Rights Movement? How did you meet Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks? When I finished high school in 1957, May 1957, 17 years old, I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't tell any of my teachers, I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my sisters or brothers. I had applied to attend a little school called Troy State College, now known as Troy University, 10 miles from my home. Dr. King wrote me back, sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket, and invited me to come to Montgomery. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little school in Nashville, Tennessee. An uncle of mine gave me a hundred dollar bill, more money than I ever had. Gave me a foot locker, one of these big upright trunks that you open up, bring it back together put my clothes in, my few books, everything that I own, except those chickens, and took a Greyhound bus to Nashville. And after being in Nashville for about three weeks, I told Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., rather one of my teachers who knew Dr. King, that I had been in contact with Martin Luther King Jr. This teacher informed Dr. King that I was there. Dr. King got back in touch with me and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. So in March of 1958, by this time I'm 18 years old, I boarded a bus, I traveled to Montgomery, and a young lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who had been a lawyer for Rosa Parks, for Dr. King, and the Montgomery Movement, 
and later became our lawyer during the Freedom Rides in the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me at the Greyhound bus station and drove me to the First Baptist Church, pastor by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King, and ushered me in to the pastor's study. And I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy standing behind a desk. I was so scared, I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave him my whole name. And he started calling me the boy from Troy. He told me if I wanted to attend Troy State, movement in Montgomery would support me. Fair graded lawyer would support me. May have to file a suit against the state of Alabama or Troy State. But it would be dangerous. So your family could lose their home, could be bombed or burned, they could lose the land. I went back and had a discussion with my mother and my father. They didn't want to have anything with me going there. So I continued to study in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was in Nashville that a group of students, black and white college students from Vanderbilt University, Peabody College, Tennessee State University, Fish University, American Baptist Theological Seminary, Meharry Medical College, and every Tuesday night in a little Methodist church, we would come together for almost an entire school year and study the way of peace, the way of love, the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Study what Gandhi attempted to accomplish in South Africa what they accomplished in India. Study what Martin Luther King Jr. and the people in Montgomery was all about. And many of us grew to accept the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, as a way of life, as a way of living. We'd be sitting in at lunch counters and restaurants, and someone would come up and spit on us, or put a lighted cigarette out in our hair, or down our backs, pour hot water, hot coffee, hot chocolate on us pull us off to lunch kind of stools. But we didn't strike back. No one day we were told that if we continued to sit in at the lunch counters, we would be arrested. We would be put in jail. So I made a decision that if I were going to get arrested, I wanted to look good. I wanted to look what some young people used to call, I guess, sharp, uh, maybe fresh, <laughs> uh, uh, maybe clean. Had very, very little money. So I went downtown Nashville to a used men's store, and I bought a suit. And a vest came with the suit. You know how much I paid for this suit? I paid $5. If I still had the suit today, I probably could sell it on eBay for a lot of money. <laughs> but when I was arrested and went to jail the first time, I felt liberated. I felt free. So during the 60s, I was arrested 40 times. And since I've been in Congress, five more times. And I'm probably going to get arrested again for something. Because my philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to speak up, to speak out, and stand up. So maybe some of you saw on television, or read about it, or maybe through social media, that a group of us in the Congress had a sit-in on the floor of the house, in the well of the house, we wanted the leadership of the Congress to bring forth a piece of legislation to do something about gun violence. There's too much violence, too much violence.
We're losing, we're losing too many of our young people. We're losing too many young people. Too many children. Too many of our mothers and fathers. A few days ago, I was in Philadelphia speaking in front of a house where Martin Luther King Jr. had lived when he was studying in Philadelphia, near Philadelphia, in Westchester, Pennsylvania, at Crozer Theological Seminary. And there was a mother there with an 18 days old little baby. A few days earlier, she had lost her eight-year-old daughter. So I gave her a hug. And I said, I'm sorry, but we will continue to do something, to fight, to do something about gun violence. And as young people, as students, you have to say to members of Congress, do what you can to stop the violence. Just this morning, I heard there was a shooting at a shopping mall in Houston, Texas. How many more people must die to hand a gun violence? We must teach everyone to lay down the instruments and tools of violence and create a war community at peace with itself. We were beaten, but we didn't fight back. Just think, many, many years ago, when I had all of my hair and a few pounds lighter, black people and white people couldn't be seated on a Greyhound or Trailway bus leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. We were on our way to New Orleans to test a decision of the United States Supreme Court. Black and white people, some students. The same year President Obama was born in 1961. But because of our efforts, those signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, those signs are gone. And the only place that you will see those signs today will be in a book, in a museum, or on a video, and they will not return. I, I, wish, I, I, I wish Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., maybe he's looking down from heaven, could see you, see you, see you beautiful, handsome, young people sitting here together. That's what he dreamed of. That's what we all dream of, the creation of the beloved community. But we can lay down the burden of race. And it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We are one people, we are one family, we all live in the same house, American house. On the Freedom Ride, my seatmate was a young white gentleman. We arrived in a little town called Rock Hill, South Carolina. We got off the bus, we started in a so-called white waiting room. We marked white waiting. A group of guys beat us, left us lying in a pool of blood. May 1961. But many years later, to be exact, in February 09, One of the guys that beat us came to my office on Capitol Hill and said, Mr. Lewis, I've been a member of the Klan. He was in his 70s. I want to apologize. Will you forgive me? Will you accept my apologies? His son came with him, he was in his 40s. His son started crying. His father started crying. They hugged me. I hugged them back. 
And I said, I accept your apology, I forgive you, and I started crying. It is the power of the way of peace, the way of love, the power of nonviolence. So I said to you as young people, never ever become bitter. Never ever get lost in a sea of despair. And never ever hate, for hate is too heavy a burden to bear. This little planet that we call Earth, this little spaceship is ours to save and to preserve it for generation yet unborn. We must leave it a little cleaner, a little more peaceful for generation yet unborn. So I said to you as you continue to study, never ever give up, never ever give in, never lose hope. and do what you can to redeem the soul of America. If we get it right, and I believe we would get it right here, I believe we would get it right, we can serve as a model for the rest of the world. I know there are some forces, there are some people saying nothing has changed, but I said come and walk in my shoes and I will show you change. People can register to vote, we walked across that bridge in Selma. Some people were asked to count the number of bubbles on a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans in a jar. But if someone had told me that one day I would be a member of the House of Representatives, elected by the good people of Georgia, black and white, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans. If someone had told me that one day that I will live to have an opportunity to get to know and meet President Kennedy when I was 23 years old, to meet his brother and work in his campaign, Robert Kennedy, to travel to Rome and meet with the Pope, to travel to South Africa and meet Nelson Mandela, and to live to see an African American become President of the United States of America. So maybe, just maybe one day, one of you will be a great lawyer, a doctor, a great teacher, a scientist, an engineer, a member of Congress, maybe President of the United States. So hold on to your dream. Keep the faith. Keep building. Keep coming together as one community, as one people. Thank you very much. What do you believe was the defining moment of the civil rights era and what lessons from that era can be applied to the raci racial divisions we are seeing today? I think one of the finest moments when President Johnson on August 6, 1965 signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But he made one of the most moving one of the most meaningful speeches I think any American president made in modern time, the whole question of civil rights or voting rights. When he spoke to the nation on March 15, 1965, eight days after Bloody Sunday, when he said, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and for the destiny of the democracy. But at the end of that speech, he said, as he spoke to the joint session of the Congress and the nation, he said, and we shall overcome. I was sitting in a room with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and tears came down his face. He cried and we all cried earlier. To hear the President of the United States, the first president to say, and we shall overcome. 
Dr. King said, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery. And he was right, we did. And he said, the Voting Rights Act would be passed, and it was passed. That changed America forever. How did you find the strength to persevere in your nonviolent movements when facing down angry mobs and after the beatings you suffered in Selma and elsewhere? Did you ever experience self-doubt? How did you keep the faith even when your beloved leader and friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was assassinated in April 1968? I truly believed in, in the way of peace, the way of love, the philosophy, and the discipline of nonviolence. I thought I was going to die on, on that bridge. I thought I saw death. And I said to myself, I'm not gonna give up. This may be the last nonviolent protest. And I'm not going to hate. I'm gonna hold on to my beliefs. And you come to that point where you don't doubt yourself a doubt the, the rightness of what you're all about, and so you have to keep going. I love Martin Luther King Jr. He was like a big brother. He inspired me. Had been for him, I don't know what would have happened to me and so many other people. But you have to pick up and, and, and keep moving. And in the process, you have to Keep your faith and keep your eyes on the prize and be happy. What was your biggest regret in terms of the civil rights movement's actions and strategies? What would you have done differently in hindsight? I'm, I'm not so sure what I would have done different. I think I would have, if I could have spent more time listening and talking with Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he was very, very young when he was assassinated. And I think we all felt that he was gonna be around much longer. I think I could have learned much more from him. He, um, he was a wonderful man. Sometime he would be, I became a member of his daddy's church. We called him Daddy King. And later Dr. King became the co-pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And Martin Luther King Jr. would be in a pulpit preaching. And sometimes his father would be sitting in the pulpit or maybe in the audience. And he would say, son, make it plain, make it plain. And that's what I think Dr. King was trying to make the cause of civil rights plain and real to all Americans. And that's what we have to continue to do today to make our issues and our needs real and try to do something about it. In your opinion, what is the most direct cause of rising voter cynicism in the country? And what steps can we as a nation take to address this problem? As a nation and as a people, we must continue to come together and engage in meaningful discussion, meaningful dialogue. We, the problems that we have, we cannot sweep them under the American rug or in some dark corner. We must confront them head on. Uh, I think if more Americans can see a, a school like this school, how people study and, and, and work together and see how diverse the student body is, you know, you're just a good looking group. And maybe it will help educate people and teach people a lesson that we can get along. We can live together as brothers and sisters, uh, like people in one house, like one family. That's the only way we must go. That is the way. Mm -hmm.